During game week, we only roll out the best guests possible and back by popular demand. It's Chase Glass from Spartans Illustrated. Let's go. You are Locked On Spartans, your daily podcast on the Michigan State Spartans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College. That's all one word for twenty dollars off of your first ticket purchase. Spartan friends, Spartan family, Locked On Spartans listeners, I, I could smell that cinnamon whiskey in the air. My feet are firmly planted on a cracked parking lot in East Lansing. It is so close to game day. Oh man! So enough, enough of me just you know, rambling on and on. Let's talk to the guy that a lot of you love when we have him on this show. He is from Spartans Illustrated. His name is Chase Glasser. Chase, only just a few more days till kickoff. How are we feeling, man? I can't wait. It's it's at the point you think about it, you read about it, you watch every game that you can get your hands on, and it's just yeah. like, I, I don't want to read anymore. I'm ready to go. Let's go. Uh, right on. And, like, it's also even outside of Michigan State, too. I was just reading the week one schedule, and I saw Utah, Florida. That, that might as well be the Super Bowl for me. Like, that, that is going to be an awesome game. I mean, kind of grimy, like they're not the best teams, but <laughs> two two brand names at least. So that's, yeah, God, can not wait for this one. Chase, I, I've asked guests this question many times. I've asked myself this question because I'm crazy and I talk to myself a lot on this show. I've asked John, Ger- John Kirby, Graham mm-hmm. Couch. I'm going to ask you, what is the number one thing you're going to be looking for on Friday? So far, the three of us have had the same answer. I'm interested to know your answer, though, for Friday. Well, I think the primary answer is the quarterback, just because that is the most important position in sports. Uh, But what I'm I'm going to be looking for personally is team cohesion. And the general general organization of the team. Are people getting into their assignments? Are there missed assignments? Are there guys in the backfield? Are there people running open when they shouldn't be? Are people generally where they're supposed to be? Um, you have had the same coordinators for four years and I'm looking for proof of concept. I'm looking for, uh, both of those guys are kind of in a prove it year for me. I'm looking yep. to, to really see something, to see proof of concept. You've got four years, ostensibly you've got your guys. Um, let's see what, what this happens when it's a, a well-oiled machine and you have, you know, a, a series of off seasons to put things together, general team cohesion, organization, crispness with the understanding that it's the first game there's going to be hiccups yeah. stupid things will happen that's just the nature of college football but I, i'd like to see kind of a general uh cohesive effort from the team and a, a good effort by whoever trots out under center sure of course um like a lot of guests do when they keep on appearing on this show we, we are in lockstep chase because my next question believe it or not who do you have your eye on more between the two coordinators, not just for this game, but for the whole season ahead? It Just like you said, it is a prove-it year for both Scotty Hazleton and Jay Johnson. Is there one that you're looking a little closer at as we go forward with this season? You know, I think if we had this conversation about week five last year, it'd be a much different question. But I'm actually 100%. going to say uh, Jay Johnson, and, and that may be surprising to some people, but I think with Scotty Hazleton, we know what he is. He's a big 12 guy. He's going to, you're you're going to be able to get between the twenties pretty easily. And then he's going to lock you down in the red zone. That's the hope when it's working. Right. And and so, I mean, for him, I'm certainly looking no big plays. That's why big plays are, are so deadly because it is more difficult to score in the red zone. The field's condensed. You can roll your safeties down. You can do a lot to play 11 on 11. Um, But with Jay Johnson, I, I don't know that I've seen him succeed at a high level or at the level that he would need to, to get the success that he wants to have at Michigan state without elite talent. Um, Mm -hmm. Not to say that there aren't good players on this team, but I don't think you have a generational running back and a guy who's just an eraser. And that's not me calling him that that's his own offensive line calling him that. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to see proof of concept there with, with what he can do. And I I don't know. I I go back and forth on him because I think the general architecture is there. You're going to run inside zone. You're going to run outside zone. There's play action. Um, You're going to put people in the position to make high leverage plays. But I'd like to see a little more scheming people open. Um, 
I'd like to see the tight ends. And, and that's something that he talks about, how the tight ends are so important in his offense. I haven't really seen that. Um, I mean, you have Tyler Hunt, you have Malik Carr, Daniel Barker, a number of others. Um, Connor Hayward was good, but I think he has a somewhat unique, unique skill set that isn't really relevant. Yeah. I think Malik Carr could be a beast. Um, and I'd be interested to see how he's deployed, assuming that he's ready. Um, so I've really gotten my eye on Jay Johnson. I'd really like to see something from the offense. I'm right with you there because I thought the usage of Daniel Barker was maybe a little underwhelming last year. And I, I just kind of talked myself into it. Well, you have, you have Jaden Reed, you have Keon Coleman. I mean, it's kind of hard to squeeze a third fiddle in there as far as targets, but I would have liked to see a little more catches with him last year, but I, whatever. I, plenty more issues last year than just <laughs> utilizing yeah. one tight end uh, above the other ones, but mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, I, it is, it is what it is. Um, right. Speaking of weapons, I want to go into a piece that you wrote for Spartans Illustrated not too long ago, and this is a man that largely us state fans don't know too much about. His name's Elante Brown. We knew him when he was a high school recruit because, well, Mark D'Antonio and company were they were, they were hot after him. Absolutely. He picks Nebraska. Didn't do too much at Nebraska. Has yet to find the end zone over there. What, what can you tell us about Elante Brown, though? Because there is some good buzz coming out of fall camp about this kid. Well, that's what I was just going to say is that you hear coming out of fall camp some really good things about him, um, mm-hmm. which is good because this is a wide receiver room in which you don't have Jeremy Bernard, you don't have Keon yeah. Coleman, you lost Jaden Reed to the draft, and you've got an unproven or at least new quarterback. So um, Elante Brown is extremely athletic. He's got a lot of wiggle. Um, at the very least, I think he could be a weapon in the return game, uh, whether okay. that's a kick returner or punt returner. That depends largely on his consistency, catching the ball, getting the ball, um, getting to the ball, things like that. Um, But I I think he's certainly someone who could be kind of the the designated end around guy, which I feel like Michigan State has had going back to about 2014. Yeah, Um, I think he could certainly do that. I think he's raw. He hasn't really refined the the tools of being a receiver. Um, But I do think that that um, Hawk has has the. pedigree to to get him there this year in year one maybe not looking at him as a down-to-down receiver but someone who's able to come in maybe run some hitches make some make some people miss in space do some things like that uh but largely i think i'm looking for him to just kind of be an athletic weapon and then hopefully grow into something down the line now if it turns out that some of this buzz comes to fruition and he's further along than we think that's nothing but a bonus yeah 100 percent. do you have an inkling of like who the top pass catcher is going to be. I'm not going to use receiver because Malik Carr can also be included in this conversation. But look, it's just Trey Mosley. It's just Malik Carr really coming back. Yes, some guys do have some experience like Montori Foster. Right. I, but it really feels like shaking a magic eight ball to see like, all right, who's <laughs> going to be the, the top guy this year? Do you have an inkling as it who it could be for these first few weeks of the season here? Uh, I mean, as far as anything insider, no, I don't. But yeah, sure. for just kind of what does the offense do and, and what has the concepts pointed you towards in the past? I'd say probably Trey Mosley working out of the slot will get a lot of looks just mm-hmm. because oftentimes you're someone who is working towards the middle of the field. And if you're working towards the middle of the field, just a lot of times that's the, the quarterback. You, you, you're looking in the pocket. You're looking downfield. You're going to see that. A lot of times that may mean you're matched up with a nickel, a linebacker, a safety. Yeah. So you'd expect someone to be able to get some pretty good leverage. He's also experienced, I think, understands the the fine art of being a receiver and route running perhaps a little bit better than someone like uh, Tyrell Henry or Montori Foster. So I'd look for him. I'd look for Malik Carr because he's a huge target and, yeah. and he is returning. Um, he's got a lot of experience that can be good or bad. I, I'd point towards it being good. He's caught a lot of balls. He's going to be a big target, kind of a security blanket maybe. If he's come along a bit, I'd look for those two. And then if you get a nice surprise on the outside, that's just fine too. Um, something else that that you saw in the spring game that I, I looked at in their film, uh, particularly with, with Nathan Carter, but also with Jalen Berger, is the ability to catch the ball coming out of the backfield. That's also right. deadly because almost always you're going to be carrying a linebacker or a safety, most of the times a linebacker. So if you can get that matchup on a, a Texas route or something like that, that could also be something uh, that's just kind of an easy dump off to, to get some free yards. And I want to switch sides of the field here in a hot second, but Chase, uh, you've done a great job of carrying this first segment. So we're just going to send you to the bench for a quick coffee break here. Uh, and also I got to talk to people's ear off about game 
time. This episode of Locked on Spartans is brought to you by GameTime.co. If you see me walking towards Spartan Stadium this Friday, I will probably be on my phone. And no, I'm not popping off a tweet or checking Instagram. I will be on the GameTime app buying my tickets. Now, why am I going to be doing that at quarter to seven on game day? Well, their flash deals and last-minute ticket sales are the best in the business. It is so easy to find and buy tickets. Also, for every kind of event, not just college football. You could also, hey, go catch a show at the theater. Go catch a concert. They got it all on game time. It is the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. When you go on the app, you can get actual real life images of your seat before you buy so you know exactly what kind of view you're going to get inside of Spartan Stadium. Just buy tickets in a matter of seconds. It is two taps on your phone and you are all set and they are sent directly to your phone. You don't have to go digging through your email as you're getting waved down through security and there's no service at Spartan Stadium. Game time makes this whole process so easy, you will not believe it. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College. That's all one word for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Also. If you want to look the best in Spartan Stadium or at your tailgates or at the sports bar or in your basement, homefieldapparel.com is where to get the hookup for all of your game day needs. From their bomber jacket that they released last week, super fresh. You, you will faint when you see their bomber jacket. Or also, hey, hoodies, long sleeve t-shirts, actual t-shirts, they got it all for all genders. It is the best in the business. They use old school logos, vintage looking apparel. And as good as they look, when you put home field apparel clothing on, you're going to feel even better. It is like putting a cloud over your torso, ladies and gentlemen. So go to homefieldapparel.com, check out, but not without hitting LOS23 as a promo code first for 15% off of your first order. That is LOS23 for 15% off of your first order over at homefieldapparel.com. And let's get the one the only Chase Glasser of Spartans Illustrated back into the mix here. Chase, let's switch to the other side of the ball. Let's talk about a position group that uh, about 76,000 eyeballs will be on at Spartan Stadium and then many more on their televisions. It's the secondary. Uh, I'm going to really, I'm really going to shock a lot of people here. It has not been good the last few years. Is Terry Roberts the answer? It's just simple as Terry Roberts being the answer. You also did a film room piece on him not too long ago. And this is a kid that he gets to Michigan State. I'm like, cool, that's depth. He hasn't really played a lot. I'm not going to expect much out of him. I'm starting to think that I, I could be in the wrong here. Like, he might actually add some juice to this room. What, what, what do you got on my, my guy Terry Roberts here? Well, I certainly think you'll see him the first couple of weeks. I don't know where he shakes out in the depth chart, but okay. he's a warm body. He is someone with playing experience. And he did play for Phil Parker uh, under Iowa. They played a nasty, nasty cover, too. Yeah. So um, those guys are extremely well coached. They are, um, even if they're not necessarily the most athletic that notwithstanding, they're smart, they're heady, uh, and they recognize leverage extremely well. So you'd think that he'd have those tools um, that he'd be able to come in with. He he is an able and willing tackler, I'd say. And it's just going to wind up where he shakes out compared to some of the others, Where it, whether it be, um, you know, whoever it is, pick your, your name out of the hat, uh, who you want to see at corner. He's definitely going to slot to the outside. I, I don't see him playing in the nickel at all. Um, but he's someone who I think you'll see compete for playing time, um, smart, heady. Uh, and I think he's going to be a transfer that will be someone who would be ahead of, say, a Chester Kimbrough or somebody like that, that can okay. transfer, maybe uh, a mere speed. I think you can expect him to be ahead of the game, both if not athletically, uh, certainly intellectually than both of those. I, I think he will come in ahead of the curve of, of either of those guys. So I think he's got a path to playing time a little earlier. Both of those guys got on the field early. Um, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the room has gotten a bit deeper in past years, right? But uh, I still think there's certainly an avenue for him to play. I, I could see him being a contributor, absolutely. Got a hit on one of these transfer cornerbacks. And I, I, I say that, I mean, 
choose my words carefully because one of them just got drafted to the NFL. So I guess it wasn't all a failure with the right. Amir Speed. But hey, Bill Belichick, he is a wizard. When he sees that frame, he's looking at Amir Speed and being like, I could break that horse like that. I can make this work. <laughs> the people in East Lansing can't, but I will. So. Or at least it's certain, yeah. certainly a, a special teams contributor, whether it be a gunner, oh, oh, yeah. get down at punt returns, something like that. Um, Definitely. Who knows what goes on in, in, in Bill Belichick's mind? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, who, who knows? I, I do want to ask you a question, and this is a question that I've gotten from a few listeners here, mm-hmm. and this is throughout the summer of the offseason, like, hey, what do you want to see this year? Sometimes I'll be asked this question out of the blue, or sometimes I even ask a question just told that they want to see more pressing from our cornerbacks this year. I want to pick your brain about this because uh, you can explain this brilliantly. Um would that make sense? Does Michigan State already press enough, in your opinion, or does that just go against everything that Scotty Hazleton stands for? Where, where do you stand on corners pressing, if you will? So, press man. So, so normally what that means is you are lined up one yard across from the receiver, normally with inside leverage. You're forcing somebody to the outside, generally indicative of man-to-man defense, at least at that position. And I think the, the biggest question to ask with with – the pressing is, is what does that mean colloquially, right? Like, what does that mean to the person that's asking it? I would say in a lot of scenarios, it's someone who's frustrated with why are these guys playing 10 yards off on third and yeah. five or something like that. That is um, a sentiment that I understand, but mm. I, Scotty Hazleton's many things. I don't think they're stupid. Right. And in my experience at the line of scrimmage, quarterbacks, especially if you're experienced at all, you have a series of checks, right? And a lot of times it, it, you can take this from Michigan State, uh, the New England Patriots to Notre Dame Prep High School. If you see press man with inside leverage, nine times out of 10, the quarterback will tell that wide receiver to convert to a fade. Hand signal, tapping the helmet. Something sometimes it's not even spoken, it's just automatic. If you see someone yeah. press man without a safety over the top, you convert that to a fade. Um, a, a similar complaint, I think, with a lot of the people that say we need to press more. Well, these cornerbacks aren't athletic enough, they're getting beat all the time. So, I would take you back to a game that we all remember well the 2020 Michigan game, where you have guys like Vince Gray and Jamon Green who are athletically limited. They were put in press man by Don Brown and Ricky White absolutely detonated on them. It, everybody, oh, remembers, yeah. <laughs> everybody remembers that, right? So it doesn't, I understand the frustration of why are we playing so far off? Why are we giving them free yards? That's extremely frustrating. And I do think that someone like Salgado might be able to come in and, and maybe coach people up on the, intricacies of being a corner, improve their technique. You might be able to come up a little bit closer. You might, you may be able to play a little bit more technique, but it's not uh, as formulaic as well. As my cornerbacks get better, I'm going to roll them up more. I just, you, it, I would rather give up five yards than 50 yards. And there were times uh, I believe against Washington last year where Michigan state did press and uh, at the line Penix checked to a switch verts and I forget which receiver it was, but was just screamingly wide open for a touchdown. Yes. And yes. it's one of those things where with the personnel, you're a bit damned if you do, damned if you don't. And that's where you look at at Tucker and, and people can talk all the live long day about whether it's Antonio, whether it's Tucker recruiting this and that. It is an immutable mm-hmm. fact, in my opinion, that the talent on the team is deeper this year than it has been in past years. And that there are bodies in the secondary that are coming along, whether it be a Dylan Tatum. I mean, personally, I think he projects more to like a little bit of a nickel or a corner um, or, or other people who, who have we've heard good things about Malcolm Jones being one. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's you hope that those guys are a little more athletic and they're able to put their foot in the ground and drive on the ball. But the entire structure of this defense is much different than what the D'Antonio defense was where he was playing press quarters. Now, you look at what he had, guys like Trey Waynes, Dark West Denard, people like that. These are excellent, excellent players. They also fit a physical profile. Those guys are big. Those are big yeah. corners. And a lot of times in D'Antonio's best defenses, those guys 
when they were able to come into the defense and contribute, they were upperclassmen. They'd been in the system for three, four years. They knew that down to a science because there's all sorts of rules and responsibilities and just technique that comes with playing quarters press or, or match quarters like, like D'Antonio ran. You just don't have that, the same luxury right now. So it, it's an interesting kind of conundrum because I understand the frustration. I really do. But also, you don't want to see people wide open down the seam. Um, so you hope that the talent gets better and it's able to work. But at the same time, you saw proof of concept in 2021 where, yes, um, there were times that that didn't work. I'll talk about that in a minute. But largely, yeah. it worked where, hey, you can drive the field on us and we're going to shut you down in between or in the red zone. You can drive the 20s. You can drive in between the 20s. We're going to force field goals in the red zone. Right now, the issue with this is that because the players are athletically limited, there is a susceptibility to big plays. Okay. And that is what just kills you. If, if you can put a lid on the, on the big plays, then yeah. all of a sudden this becomes a lot more workable. I point to the Michigan game, right? Michigan yeah. didn't get hardly anything over the top. When they were successful mm -hmm. passing the ball, it was when they got a tight end with leverage on a safety. That happens, okay? But in the red zone, what are we going to do? We're going to roll the safeties down. We're going to fill gaps. Uh, we're going to have a safety on the quarterback run um, so that that mesh point read, you know, I think there, there was three or four times that McCarthy pulled it in the red zone. It was not successful. OK, and they forced field goals. And I think going into that game, you say, hey, if if we hold Michigan to 29 points, I think most people feel pretty good about that, especially with the caveat that seven of those points were a direct result of the long snapper throwing it over Barringer's head. Right. Not so, good. Not I mean, good. Yeah. That's something that's functional. That, that's against a good team. It, it's kind of like there's a metagame in college football where right. Ohio State is built to win national championships. Penn yep. State is built to beat Ohio State or at least compete with them. Michigan State is built to beat Ohio State in a different way that Penn State is. And Michigan also has the capability to run through Penn State. But Michigan is not built to win a national title in the same way that Ohio State is with that yeah. developed passing game, things like that. Similarly, um, Michigan State is pretty well equipped, I think, to slow down a team like Michigan. We're going to bow up in the red zone. We're going yep. to have a really strong front seven. You might get between the 20s, but you're going to kick a lot of field goals. Okay. But they're also built where they can just get torched by a, a team like Ohio State. So it's just, it, there's yeah. this constant metagame in, in college football that I think you need to take a step back and say, okay, well, why are they doing this? And I, I think until you have a new defensive coordinator, you're not going to see a massive difference in how your cornerbacks are aligned, whether they're pressing or not. Um, you never know. I mean, defensive yeah. coaches, they know how to run a lot of different coverages. You may see a cover two where they roll their corners up. I'm not saying that that won't happen, but down to down, I don't think you're going to see that tight press man. Uh, and I'm not sure that you want to. And before we get you out the door here to enjoy the rest of your game week, not just not just a normal week, a game week here. Uh, I want to just pick your brain about Central Michigan here yeah. because for Spartans Illustrated, pretty quick or pretty you know soon on the horizon, you'll have a preview yep. of Central Michigan, and we also go deeper into it uh, later on this week. We've talked with yeah. Adam Jaxa; he's a play-by-play -play guy of Central Michigan. But oh. really quick, what is something that Central Michigan will show? Uh, that you think might be a little tricky for Michigan State? Or is it a few things that you think are a little interesting that's coming from the chips here? I'd say there's really two things. And this is okay. coming almost exclusively from their game against Penn State uh, last year. I looked at yeah. someone with equitable equitable talent level, plays in the same division, something like that. Um, sim pressures. So they're going to come up. Uh, they normally run, it looks like a nickel or a 5-2, depending on personnel, things like that. Okay. Where, They'll have three down linemen, and, and their two outside linebackers will be lined up as stand-up defensive ends. Um, you see Michigan and Penn State both run something like this from time to time. Um, and then they will have cornerbacks, uh, well, more safeties, linebackers, lined up in different gaps, simulating pressures. Some guys are going to drop into coverage. Other guys will rush. They'll do a replacement blitz where one guy will show pressure, drop off, and then maybe a safety will come down, um, things like that. So with a quarterback making their first start, that's something to look at because a lot of times you'll have maybe some a safety will come in off the edge, and then you'll have one of those outside linebackers drop into the hook curl. And and uh, Cal Halliday is actually really good at doing this or was really good at doing this. He'll drop yeah. right into the zone where there's just a quick check, and they'll be able to make a play on the ball. So that's something to look for. 
um, offensively, they run a lot of tight splits. Uh, I think that in large part, that's because I have not seen anything on the roster to suggest they have anything other than just a pop gun arm quarterback. Um, so they run a lot of tight splits, a lot of pre-snap motion. They look somewhat like Michigan state. A lot of the times where you have a two by one with an offset tight end kind of lined up off the, uh, rear rear hip of the guard um an offset tight end uh they use that a lot a lot of motion um i just don't think they have a developed passing game last year they had a guy named lou nichols uh who was the leading rusher in college football in 2021 if you live in southeast michigan you may remember him from a billboard on the lodge where it's the best running back in the state of michigan which was very funny (laughs) <laughs> uh, a little marketing bit there. Uh, he wasn't as good last year, uh, but he was a player. They don't have him this year. Uh, they had a, a pretty good wide receiver whose name I forget. Um, I want to call him Corleone, but that's not it. Um, gotcha. and, and he's gone. So, you know, it's, it's they don't have some of the players they had last year. Uh, they run a lot of deep coverages because I don't think they trust their guys in, in coverage. I think Sean Clifford threw his first incompletion with 10 minutes left in the second quarter. Uh, when they played Penn State last year. So, I mean, look for that. Look at how whoever starts uh, will handle the the um, simulated pressures and uh, how the defense handles the switching of assignments with motion. And uh, I, I don't think MSU should have a whole lot of trouble. You know, I, I don't know if you're a betting man or not, but we do know that you are a smart man. When it comes <laughs> to 14 and a half points, Michigan State is obviously favored in this game. Mm-hmm. When you see that number, what, what are you thinking? Are you thinking, yeah, that's about right, or is that an easy cover for MSU, or dare I say, a, an easy cover for the team from Mount Pleasant? Well, I mean, good judged people would disagree on whether I'm a smart guy or not. But but mm, okay. uh, as, as far as the the, the point, I, I would take MSU to cover. Uh, I think it, okay. it could look quite a bit like Western Michigan last year, where gotcha. it's close for, for a half, it's close for a time, and uh, yeah. by about halfway through the third quarter, you're sitting back going, okay, you know, it's, it's going to be – 38 to 16, and we're feeling pretty good. Some things to work on. Let's see what we look like next week against Richmond. Uh, I, I would take MSU to cover. I'm, I'm in the same boat as far as like it, MSU won't ever feel like they're in danger, but I logged in my prediction for Spartans Illustrated at 28 to 17. Mm-hmm. So not covering, but late touchdown from Central. I, sure. Central re- returns 10 guys on defense. They have Dante yeah. Kent. Like I, I, I don't think it'll be a great day for passing, but I think we could all leave the stadium being like, yeah, the, the rushing game's pretty good, but I. I'm, yeah. I'm just rambling and now beginning to spiral. Um, yeah. Because, well, I mean, it, it, yeah. Most important stats who wins, right? And, and I think either team. Just give me the money up, line. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I would be um, if, if if this is a competitive, competitive game with with about a quarter left. Um, it, it could happen. Weirder things have happened. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's um, something where I think it's good that you're not playing an absolute tomato can just because you get to see, sure. you get to see what you have. And you've got a big game in week three, and and I just can't wait to, to get started. I'm, I'm so excited. Right on. Like, for the offensive line for you know, or Central Michigan's defense, like, that, that is something that you can take something away from. Absolutely. And that's when, you know, when, when I ask myself this question or John Kirby or Graham Couch, what are you looking yeah. forward to the most? It, it's the line versus line, whether it's offensive or defensive line. You can figure out a lot from the trenches, but – Loved your answer as well for that one. And just loved everything else that you contributed to the show, as you always do, Chase. I mean, hey, the people love you for a reason. You, you break it down so eloquently for us. <laughs> uh, so really, really do appreciate you, my man, and appreciate all the work that you do for Spartans Illustrated. Go subscribe to Spartans Illustrated right now. Chase, anything you want to leave us with before we kick this ball off on Friday? Well, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, Spartans Illustrated, check us out. Uh, I, I think they run a great ship over there. It's it's interesting stuff. It's it's it, the message boards are great. The content is really good. Yeah. The access is fantastic. Um, I just can't wait to get started. I mean, it's it's. I think if you listen to this podcast, your life probably revolves around these sixteen weeks in the fall a lot more than perhaps it Maybe. should. But I mean, I just it's a special thing. It's a uniquely American thing. Uh, collegiate athletics, and I'm I'm just so happy and so excited that we get to have another go around here. I can't wait. Yeah, if you're listening to this podcast five days a week, uh, there's one thing you're not, and it is a fair weathered fan. You are. You're in the thick of it with us sickos. So thank you very much, guys. It is uh, a pleasure to be part of your community. And gang, until next time, again, we will be talking with Adam Jackson, the play-by-play guy of Central Michigan here. And then, oh my God, it's going to be game day. Let's go. Let's go. All right, but until then, hey, enjoy the rest of your week. Love you all. Go Green.